Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to uh, address our exposure assessment that we conducted for FDNC color additives. So when you think of a risk analysis, there are many components that go into that. There are the regulatory and policy considerations, there's a toxicology review that looks at the safety studies and the ADI, as well as the chemistry component that is responsible for the exposure assessment that estimates the intake for the additive of interest. Today I'm gonna to focus only on the exposure assessment piece in this presentation and I will not be covering any of the toxicology or regulatory pieces. So as we've heard this morning, synthetic organic dyes are widely used in processed foods. And there's been some concern raised with these dyes due to their use in foods consumed by children and the suggested links to adverse behaviors. In the United States, there are nine synthetic dyes that when batch certified by FDA for color and purity are approved for use in food. Seven of these dyes, FD&C blue one, blue two, green three, red number three, red 40, yellow five, and yellow number six, are approved for use generally in foods at levels consistent with good manufacturing practice, meaning that no more of that color additive can be used than is necessary to achieve the intended technical effect. The other two dyes are approved for specific uses. Orange B is intended for, or is approved for use for coloring the casings of sausages and frankfurters. However, no batches of that dye have been certified by the FDA since 1974. The other citrus red number two is approved for coloring the peels of oranges not intended for further processing and no batches of citrus red number two were approved in 2018. Because the orange bee has not been used um, in foods as evidenced by not being certified in decades and the exposure to citrus red number two would expect it to be low um, since it is approved for that one use. I'm only gonna to focus today on the exposure to the FDNC coloratives that are generally used in food. So as we've heard this morning, um, in 2007, the Southampton study looked at the consumption of children's color additives and raised a concern regarding possible adverse behavioral effects. And in that study, they looked at the six dyes listed here, plus a mixture of, a mixture of those dyes with the preservative sodium benzoate. Three of those, Ponso-4R, Carmoacine, and Quinoline Yellow are not approved for use in the United States. The other three, Sunset Yellow, Tartrazine, and Allura Red, when batch certified by FDA, are approved for use in the US as Yellow 6, Yellow 5, and Red 40. In the Southampton study, the uh, dyes that were used in that study had not been batch certified by FDA. <clears throat> in response to the study in 2008, the Center for Science and the Public Interest submitted a citizen's petition to FDA asking us to revoke the approvals for eight of the FDNC color additives, the seven general use FDNC color additives as well as orange B. This petition also requested that warning labels be placed on food containing these color additives. This petition was amended in 2010 to expand the scope as well as certify that, asserted that certified colors are carcinogenic, neurotoxic, genotoxic, and cause hypersensitivity. As we've heard this morning, in response to this, FDA convened its Food Advisory Committee in 2011 and charged that committee with considering the available relevant data on the possible association between the consumption of certified color additives in food and adverse behavioral effects. We also asked the committee to advise the FDA as to what action, if any, was in warranted to ensure consumer safety. At the time of the Food Advisory Committee, we did not have information regarding the actual foods in which these Colorados were used and the use levels. So we presented a per capita exposure assessment to the advise, Food Advisory Committee. And this estimate was based on the pounds of each Colorado that were certified by FDA in 2010, as well as the population as determined by the 2010 census. In addition, we know that all of the pounds that are certified by FDA are not used in human food. Some is can be used in pharmaceuticals, drugs, it can be exported to other countries for use as well. We had data from a report by SRI Consulting that indicated about 73% of those pounds batch certified by FDA are used in human food. So we adjusted the amount of pounds certified by 73% when we estimated our per capita exposure. 
and the exposures we estimated ranged from 0.04 milligrams per person per day for green 3 up to about 18 milligrams per person per day for red 40. The Food Advisory Committee concluded that a causal link between the consumption of Colorado's by children and adverse behavioral effects were not established by the available data. In addition, they indicated that additional label information in the form of warning labels was not necessary to ensure the safe use of these color additives. They did recommend that additional safety studies be conducted to further investigate the developmental and neurotoxic effects, and they indicated that it, there was a need for a robust exposure assessment for FDNC color additives in food. So beginning in 2012, we conducted this uh, robust dietary exposure assessment for the use of those seven general use FDNC color additives in food. This exposure assessment included an analysis of representative foods containing FDNC color additives and estimated exposure to various population groups. We published this exposure in 2016 in Food Additives and Contaminants and I've included the citation here and that is the work I'm going to describe further today. So in order to begin our exposure assessment, we needed two key pieces of information. We needed to know which foods contain the color additives of interest, as well as how much was used in that food. So in order to answer that first question of which foods contain the color additive of interest, we started by using the label base by Food Essentials database, and that now is called Food Insight. And that database contains product label information from the Glatson and Mintel databases and it gave us access to about 250,000 product labels, as well as pictures of the products, the ingredient lists, and nutrition panels. Now, because the market is kind of fluid, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, because products are continuously being reformulated, they're being introduced to the market or removed from the market, we conducted our own product global survey as well to verify the information that we, can, um, that we derived from the label-based database. In order to do that, we conducted a survey at local grocery stores and stores such as Walmart and Target in the greater Washington, D.C. area from June of 2012 to May of 2014. We also used the information available on the websites of manufacturers and other publicly available online sources in order to get those, in, those foods that contained the FDNC color additives that we were interested in. To, in order to determine how much of those colors were in foods, we used analytical data, and I'll talk about that in a few slides. I want to talk a little bit more about our label survey. So we looked at over 7,300 products in our product label survey, and that covered about 52 food categories that contained at least one FDNC color additive. This was a comprehensive survey of those product categories that were previously or currently known to contain FDNC color additives. And what we would do is we would, we would write down the name of the product, if that product contained an FDNC color additive, and if it did, which ones that product contained. Um, one thing to note is that it is a snapshot in time um, due to the fluid nature of the market, so our exposure reflects those products that were in the marketplace at the time of our survey. This is not all 52 categories, but it is an example of some of those categories. And so basically what I had my intern do is go into a grocery store and just start with one aisle and go through the entire grocery store and write down the products that she found. Um, and if we had a food category that didn't contain FDNC color additives, then we didn't, we didn't consider that category further. But if she found a product in that category that contained an FDNC color additive, then we would capture it. And so as you can see, the ones we have here is quite a, broad list of categories, and if you think of your local grocery store, it pretty much covers all of those, those categories that you would see when you walk up and down the aisles. Some quick uh, observations from our survey is that we found that the products were continuously being reformulated to remove FDNC color additives. We had one brand of macaroni and cheese during our product survey remove the color additives that its brands marketed to children. We also had one bread product that when we surveyed it, it contained FDNC color additives. However, by the time the lab went to go sample that product, the FDNC color additives had been removed from that bread. The most common color additives on the product labels were blue one, red 40, yellow five, and yellow six. 
And so based on our label survey, we chose approximately 600 representative products for analysis for FDNC color additives. And we made an emphasis on those products that were marketed to children. <clears throat> the contract laboratory measured the amounts of FDNC color additives in those samples using a liquid chromatography method developed by FDA's Office of Cosmetics and Colors. And this was published in 2013 in the Journal of Agricultural Food Chemistry. Okay, for our exposure assessment, we looked at three different population groups. We looked at the U.S. population aged two years and older, children two to five years, and teenage boys 13 to 18 years. Um, as you know, children, their exposure tends to be the highest when it's consumed on a body weight basis. And children um, would also be expected to be high consumers of some of the categories that we were looking at in our survey. We included teenage boys because those of you with teenage boys know that they are high consumers of food in general, and specifically foods that could be expected to contain FD&C color additives, such as your so soft drinks and your sports drinks. Our exposure was an eaters only estimate, meaning that only those individuals that consumed at least one of the foods containing FD&C color additives over the survey period were included in our exposure assessment. We looked at the exposure at the mean and the 90th percentile, where the 90th percentile was intended to represent the high intake consumers of a given food. Okay, there's a lot of information on this slide, so stay with me. So our methodology is we identified 52 food categories that contained at least one FDNC color additive. So now that we had our food categories, we needed to know how much of those foods were consumed. So we matched that with two-day food consumption data from the 2007-2010 National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And we matched over 300 food codes from NHANES to those foods that were identified as containing an FDNC color additive. And we did this process for each FDNC color additive. And for those of you who are familiar with NHANES food codes, there's a level of granularity that varies depending upon the category. For example, like the candy and the cereal categories, they're very specific. They get down to the product, like a peanut M&M, a specific brand of cereal. However, there's other food categories that are a little more broad, um, such as like soft drinks, where it says soft drinks, fruit flavored, caffeine containing. So that food code could be represented by more than one product that were identified from our survey. So what we did is we matched the food codes with the appropriate end pain foods codes. Sometimes it was a one-to-one -one match, and sometimes more than one product would be represented by that NHANES food code. And then we assigned levels of the FDC color additive based on our analytical results to those food codes. And I'll talk in the next slide about how we did that. Um, <clears throat> we took this one step further too, and because exposure using two-day food consumption data can overestimate chronic exposure, especially for those foods that are not commonly consumed. So we also did an exposure assessment based on 10 to 14 day food frequency data from the MPD group National Eating Trends Nutrient Intake Database. And that just required taking the NHATES one step further and matching that to the MPD codes to do that exposure assessment for a longer term study. So we assigned the analytical values to those in Haynes food codes using three different exposure scenarios. We used a low exposure scenario, and in that case, we used the lowest analytical value for that in Haynes food code. So that was the bottom bracket of our exposure assessment. On the other side, for the high exposure scenario, we assigned the highest analytical value for that in given in Haynes food code. For the, and then we also wanted to look at what was a more typical exposure scenario, so we did an average exposure scenario. So that in that case, we did an average of the food code, the analytical results for the food codes represented by that enhanced food code. So we kind of had a bracket of the lower to the high exposure range. For those products where it was a one-to-one -one match, such as like something like a peanut M&M, the same value was used for the low, high, and average exposure scenarios. For, based on the two-day food consumption data, we estimated exposure to each individual food category, and then using the two-day and the 10 to 14-day food exposure data, we calculated a cumulative exposure that took into account the exposure from all of those individual food categories.
So this is the exposure for the seven FDNC color additives for the U.S. population aged two years and older. And what you can see here is that over 90% of the population surveyed consumed blue one, red 40, yellow five, and yellow six, um, followed by blue two and red three. And green three, we did not see much, very many consumers of green three. Uh, the lowest exposures were for the blue, two blues, green and red three, and the highest exposures were for red 40, yellow five, and yellow six, which is consistent with um, the observations from our label study where those are the most commonly found color additives on the product labels. Um, this is the exposure for children aged two to five years, and you can see the same trend as regards to percent eaters for the blue color, for blue one, red 40, yellow five, and yellow six. And as with the previous population, green three was the least commonly consumed. And one more time for the teenage boys aged 13 to 18 years, um, the similar trend again with the exposures being over 90% for the blue one, red 40, yellow five, and yellow six. And the highest exposures for were observed for the red 40, yellow 5, and yellow 6. And all of these values are in the paper. Instead of going over um, the charts for the 10 to 14 day data, what I've done here is taken the average exposure scenario for the U.S. population two years and older and compare the exposure when it's based on two day food consumption data with the 10 to 14 day food consumption data. And as you can see, when more survey days are included, we see an increase in the percent eaters. And so we have over 90% eaters for blue one, blue two, red 40, yellow five, and yellow six. And we see an increase in percent eaters for those categories that were really, or those colors that were really low. If our green three went from 15% to 51%. Also when the exposure is looked at over more survey days, you can see the exposure has decreased for the 10 to 14 day data was used versus the two day. And this was a similar trend that we saw for all of the population studied and all of the exposure scenarios. What I think is interesting is if we take a look at each particular color additive and look at those categories that were the top contributors to exposure for a given FDNC color additive. And I don't know if you can see that back in the back. On the right hand axis are the color additives from blue one all the way back to yellow six. This figure does not include green number three and that's because green number three we only found that in four different food categories. So we didn't include it here but I'll discuss that one a little bit later. This is for the average exposure scenario for the U.S. population aged two years or older. And what you can see is that categories such as um, I don't know if you can read those. Soft drinks, the decoration chips for baking, and juice drinks have four different color additives that were in the top five contributors of exposure for this population. And just because you don't see a pyramid for a given food category does not mean that there was not exposure to that color additive. It just means that it was not one of the top five contributors for that color additive for this population. I think it's a little bit easier to break it out by color. And so what we did is we took the top 10 categories that contributed to exposure for each FDNC color additive. So right here, this is for blue number one. And in blue is the US population, two years and older. In red is children, two to five years. And in yellow is teenage boys, 13 to 18 years. And what you can see, um, the categories juice drinks, decoration chips for baking, soft drinks, ice cream cones, frostings and icings, breakfast cereals, and soft candies and gummies were the trap contributors to blue one exposure for all three populations. And once again, as with the previous slide, just because there isn't a bar for a population group for that category does not mean there was not exposure for that color out of it, just means it was not one of the top 10 contributors for that population for blue number one. For blue number two, breakfast cereal was by far the highest contributing category to exposure for all three populations with over 40% of the exposure to blue number two coming from breakfast cereals. 
followed by decoration chips for baking, and then frozen dairy, desserts, um, and sherbet, toaster pastries, and cakes and cupcakes for all three populations. Um, the pudding category was also a top contributor for children two to five years in the U.S. population. And this is the figure for green number three. So as I indicated before, we only found four categories that contained green number three. And over 99% of the exposure was due to that frozen dairy dessert and sherbet category. And in fact, the U.S. population two years and older was the only category that had exposure in all four of the food categories. And breakfast cereal was the only other category that had exposure for all three populations. But once again, the frozen dairy dessert category was by far the largest contributor for green three. For red number three, um, the decoration chips for baking was the highest for the U.S. population two years and older. But we found the ice cream cones was the highest contributing category for children two to five and teenage boys, as well as frostings and icings, frozen dairy desserts and sherbets, and soft candies and gummies. Moving to red 40, where soft drinks were the highest for the U.S. population two years and older and teenage boys, and juice drinks was the highest for children two to five. Um, once again, we saw frozen dairy desserts as the, a contributor, breakfast cereal, cookies, and cakes and cupcakes for two of the populations. Moving to FDNC yellow number five, once again, some of the same similar categories where juice drinks and soft drinks were our highest contributing categories for teenage boys. Juice drinks um, by far and the largest for children two to five. And we also saw snack foods, cakes and cupcakes, and frozen dairy desserts and sherbets as a top contributor for all three populations. And finally, yellow six um, followed a pretty similar trend with soft drinks, snack foods, soft drinks, our sports drinks, juice drinks, and breakfast cereal being those top contributing categories. So in conclusion, conclusion, we estimate exposure for each general FDNC color additive for the U.S. population, children two to five, and teenage boys 13 to 18 years. For all of our populations and exposure scenarios, the highest cumulative exposures were for red 40, yellow five, and yellow six. Um, breakfast cereal, juice drinks, soft drinks, and the frozen dairy desserts Sherbert category were the top contributors to exposure for multiple populations for all, um, or for all three populations from multiple color additives. <laughs>